A few months back, I had done a review of Gods and Goddesses Redux by the folks at Jetpack 7. Uh, I had pretty much done a 45 minute long video where I kind of touched on a little bit of each section from front to back. And while that was good, it was a little on the long form side. So I thought maybe now I do a little more deep dive into a couple specific areas that I find interesting. Uh, and we'll talk about it in just a sec. So stay tuned. Full stop, it's Greek mythology. I love it, and I love Percy Jackson. End of story. What's going on, folks? Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and as I just stated, with Mythic Odysseys of Theros having released a focus on Greek mythology in D&D &D, and me rereading the entire Percy Jackson and the Olympian series, and really I'll be rereading all of those books, uh, there's some Greek mythology-based stuff in Gods and Goddesses Redux, so I wanted to cover that. First of all, a big thank you to uh, Jetpack7 for sponsoring this video. We've been working together for a while, and I really enjoy just talking to those folks, and they always help build to give me stuff for giveaways and stuff. It's really cool. Uh, again, these are the books, uh, God and Goddesses Redux. This is the standard cover. This is a limited edition cover. I don't know if you can tell that this is shiny foil, but even the standard cover with Thor on it is still pretty cool. Speaking of, there'll be a link in the description if you'd like to go over to Jetpack 7's website and pick up any of these books or any of their other products uh, for yourself. And you can use the coupon code NERDIMMERSION at checkout to get yourself 10% off the order. You don't necessarily have to order the books. You can order just PDFs if that's more your style or get both if you're interested. So that being said, let's jump over to here. As I've stated in many, many videos, if you don't have bookmarks on your PDF, why are you even doing this? Well, they do. Uh, and as I said, I've been rereading Percy Jackson. So there's Athena is an avatar in here, as is Hecate. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing is going into the two Athena-based subclasses, as well as the Hecate-themed adventure. So let's go ahead and find those. So we have the Hoplite archetype for the fighter, and I think it's Polius, Polias domain. I don't know how you pronounce it. I'm not good with all the right words uh, for the cleric. And then we'll talk about the Hecate adventure. So for a hoplite, think uh, think your typical Greek phalanx, maybe even 300 if that's more your style. Shield, spear, moving as kind of a, a shield-based warrior. Athena being the goddess of wisdom that involves tacticians, battle prowess, battle planning, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so makes sense. So obviously shields are going to be big for this fighter. If you don't want to be a, sh a shield and sword or shield and X weapon uh, fighter, don't play Hoplite. Level three, you get formation. Whenever an ally is adjacent to you, while you're wielding a shield, that ally has half cover. So that's going to mean a plus two to AC and a plus two on dexterity saving throws. In addition, you can use your action to set yourself in a defensive stance. While in this stance, allies adjacent to you have three quarters cover until the beginning of your next turn. So oh, something else I wanted to say that even though Jetpack 7 is sponsoring this video and I'm going through all of this, if something seems off to me or is unbalanced or something like that, I'm going to call it out because that's just who I am and that's I'm not going to sacrifice my integrity for a sponsorship. That's just not how I roll. So being said, uh, first of all, I don't know if 5th edition, I can't remember off the top of my head, and it's just because it's one of those things that you probably have read through, and I read a lot of homebrew and DMs guild stuff, so people say things, but I don't know if 5e technically uses the term adjacent anymore. Um, this was, so when you think about adjacent, that typically means within five feet on like a gridded map. So if you're looking at a battle map, like, like this one right here, Right, if you're in this spot, anybody within, you know, next to you on said map would be considered adjacent to you. Problem being, uh, gridded combat isn't necessarily a guarantee in fifth edition to the point where, like, it's an optional section in the Dungeon Master's Guide, like fighting with grids. So, theater of the mind is also heavily implied, and adjacent is kind of hard to distinguish when you don't have that. So if you adjacent could mean, I think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different people, depending on where they are around you. I think fifth edition uses the terminology within five feet as opposed to adjacent. So that might be something that I do is change this if I were Jetpack 7 to within five feet to allies within five feet of you while you're wielding a shield have half cover. That I think makes more sense. It's also cleaner and clearer if you are playing with theater of the mind. Um, 
And then while in this stance, allies within five feet of you, if you do that stance as an action, have three quarters cover until the beginning of your next turn. That makes it that makes sense too, because if they move away from that five foot, then they lose it. And then like if they move away and come back, they could still get it. It's just, I think, a little bit cleaner wording. Uh, flat out giving potentially plus, you know, eight allies a plus two to AC is not a small thing. Uh, just for them standing next to you, but you're going to typically be a fighter. You're a hoplite. You're probably going to be up front in combat. So that's really only going to be beneficial to other folks that are going to be up in the thick of things with you. It makes you a good defensive front line, uh, right? Because people around you will get the bonus. If someone else in your party is also a hoplite, that kind of helps build out that phalanx mentality. You're giving them a plus two. They're giving you a plus two. I like that. And if you as a fighter are willing to sacrifice your entire action which could potentially be up to four attacks if you're very late in the game, uh, for giving an ally plus five to AC and a plus five to deck saving throws, then I think that kind of balances it out. I'm not sure if giving up your whole action should be, you can do this for a certain, um, like a certain number of times per day or per long rest, but given the fact that it is sacrificing your whole action to do so, I think that kind of balances out. And then at seven, you get absorbing blows. Whenever you take da uh, damage from a ranged attack while wielding a shield, you subtract a number from, uh, you may subtract a number of uh, total damage uh, roll equal to your AC given by your shield. So basically, it, it, your shield is typically plus two. So if you get hit with an arrow and it does eight damage to you, it will do six damage. There's no action required to reduce it. It also says a ranged attack, so that covers spells as well. So if someone shoots a firebolt at you, it's going to reduce that firebolt by your AC's bonus. It also means it stacks with a magical shield. So if the shield's a plus three shield and it gives you a total five bonus to your AC from the shield, it will reduce that damage by five. In addition, you may use your reaction to take the damage of any ranged attack that targets an ally benefiting from your formation. I would capitalize formation here because the formation means the level three ability, not just a general formation. I realize that's a nitpick, but you got to be specific when you're doing these kind of things. Um, so if they're within five feet of you, which is again, if we change formation to be that, you can choose as your reaction to take the damage someone else takes. I like this too, because if you have some sort of inherent damage resistance, this will also apply. So let's say it was a fire bolt dealing damage to your ally. You could take the damage for yourself, and let's say maybe you're a tiefling fighter, you're going to reduce that damage by whatever your shield's going to reduce it by, and then you would cut the damage in half again because you're resistant. So again, cool ways to help benefit an ally at the same time as, you know, while you're still taking the damage. Athena being the goddess of wisdom and, and tactics and battle strategy and things like that, tactician here makes sense at 10th level. Proficiency in history and advantage on history checks to discern the nature of a creature's battle tactics and gain advantage on insight checks to discern who an enemy is most likely to attack. Well, that's not really a thing in 5e. I, I mean, I guess, right? You could make an insight check to discern who an, ally, an enemy is going to attack next, but that's not something you can do standard in 5th edition. Like, there's not an action to detect what an enemy is going to do. Obviously, your DM can allow that. Like, there's an action to take a perception check to search things, but that's not actually a standard, like, mechanic. So I'm not sure how useful that's going to be. Proficiency in history is useful. You'll, you'll have it all the time. An advantage on history checks to discern the nature of a creature's battle tactics. Again... If you're researching a creature, let's say a dragon or something else, and you want to know what it can do, that's good. I think that was a lot better in third edition and maybe even fourth and prior when the stat block in the monsters manual manual gave you what they did in combat. Because that's for those of you who don't know or only new to fifth edition, back in three five, it would basically spell you. I uh, mean, again, I, can, I only say three five and three e because that's the only experience I have with D and D outside of fifth edition. Um, it would tell you basically what the monster would do. It kind of would give you a breakdown, give you all the stats, give you the lore, and it would tell you like, here's what it would do in combat. First, it will do this, and then it will do this and whatever. So you had an idea of what its battle strategy would be, which is great as a DM because it kind of made it, you could kind of like, not zone out, but you had it all kind of planned out for you. Um, and that would be great. This ability would be great for that because then you would know, like, typically they start with their breath weapon, then they do this and this and this, and then they do this. Whereas 
I guess it, it kind of like weird metagamey knowledge. Like the DM would have to tell you who the enemy is going to attack next with the insight check. But like, what if the DM forgets that by the time the combat comes around to the next turn? You know what I mean? I don't know. So not the best ability, but it is what it is. All right. Then at 15th level, you get charge. Um, whenever you move at least 10 feet towards a creature, no more than one size larger than you, you can use a bonus action to attempt to knock them prone. They must succeed on a strength saving throw with a DC equal to eight plus your strength modifier plus your proficiency bonus, or they are knocked prone. That's good. Um, it kind of steps on the toes a little bit of the shield master feet, which you feel like you probably would want to take, but that's kind of something they're already offered. So I don't know. Um, not bad though, overall. And then at 18, you get one with a shield. While in combat, you gain temporary hit points equal to your shield's AC bonus at the beginning of each of your turns. Again, good. I don't think it's 18th level fighter good, though. Considering, like, a champion fighter is just healing a ton of HP at this point. Like, they're healing, I mean, you know, I don't know. It just seems like, unless you're doing crazy homebrew shields, the best shield you're going to, in theory, have is a plus five shield. Or, sorry, a plus three shield, which is a total of five, which would be five temporary hit points at the start of every turn in combat, which is nothing to shake a stick at. So, I don't know. Maybe in that scenario where you have the plus three shield at 18th level, then it's a big deal. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. So, next up, we have the Polias, Polias Domain. Uh, cleric for Athena, right? So your legendary level of patience and discipline. I know the fine line between a gentle hand and an iron fist. So that's important because that definitely is present throughout what they get. So um, it says alignment any good. We don't, alignments are kind of meh in fifth edition. There's been a whole big argument about that going around. I've seen on certain social uh, social media sites, but I don't know, 5th edition alignment, there's no alignment keyed spells, there's no alignment themed classes or subclasses, so you don't have to worry about that. So domain spells you're going to get are Bless and Find Familiar, Common Motions, Enhance Ability, Aura of Vitality, Haste, Freedom of Movement, Stone Skin, Commune, and Destructive Wave. So a couple of big standouts on there are Commune for free as always prepared is great, Destructive Wave, very limited classes get access to it. Primarily just the Paladin and the Tempest Cleric, but you're going to also get it, which is nice. Bless, not having to prepare it. Useful. I mean, find familiar, right? That's the clear standout. That's one of the best spells in the game. Uh, and you're going to have it as a Cleric. Very big. Haste as well. Uh, and Aura Vitality, a good one as well. Usually a Paladin spell. Um, but yeah. And then at first level, you're going to get proficiency in Heavy Armor. And it says Melee Martial Weapons. I'm just going to say why be specific right that's not how fifth edition works typically it says proficiency in heavy armor and and martial weapons just give them the ranged weapons too not a big deal uh all right then at first level you're also going to get negotiation whenever you attempt a charisma check to calm an opponent or avoid violence you can add your wisdom modifier to the rolls total you may do so after you make the roll but before the dm decides if it's a success wisdom modifier times per long rest i like this ability a lot it's kind of giving you that whole using your mind and wisdom maybe we don't have to fight that kind of a thing i like that charisma is not typically going to be something a cleric is very good at it doesn't necessarily mean the case but if you're balancing your stats obviously you want your wisdom to be higher so you would add that to the charisma checks which is good at second level you're also going to a second level sorry you're going to get channel divinity battle tactician um as an action, you may enter a state of increased reflexes and insight in combat for one minute. Whenever an ally within 30 feet of you misses with an attack, you may use your reaction to allow your ally to re-roll that attack. I really like this. I think it's good. I think the title Battle Tactician is done well. It is a reaction that's not giving your ally advantage. It's just re-rolling an attack. So that means things that get advantage that have benefits from it, like, say, a rogue or a paladin for fishing for crits. It's not, it's just potentially turning a miss into a hit, and they can still potentially miss, uh, and it's a channel divinity. At sixth level, you're going to get turn violence. This one, I feel like I remember this was an unearthed arcana that got recycled, I think. Uh, whenever a hostile creature within 30 feet of you is reduced to zero hit points, you can expend a use of your channel divinity to leave the creature at one hit point instead. The creature must succeed on a wisdom saving throw against your spell save DC or be charmed by you for one hour. During this hour, you have advantage on charisma checks against the creature. A creature immune to being charmed cannot be targeted by this channel divinity option. All right. Weapons of war. 
This one's a throwaway, and I'll tell you why. Athena grants you greater knowledge on how to use your weapons. Whenever you first deal damage to your with your weapon on your turn, it deals an additional D8 of your weapon's damage type. If it has multiple damage types, you choose the damage type of the additional D8. That's dumb because Divine Strike, the ability that all base clerics get, gives you an extra D8. It's, it's typed damage, right? It's a D8 poison damage, weapon damage type, fire damage, radiant damage. But it does an extra D8 the first time you strike with your weapon on a turn, the first attack you do, which is what this does. But then when you hit 14, it goes up again to a 2D8. So Divine Strike is just better, and I would just choose, I would just make it like the War Cleric, right? It does an extra D8 damage of the weapon's damage type. Uh, and then High Polias, Polias, whatever it is, probably Polias, that sounds more Greek in my mind, at 17th level. Uh, you become permanently affected by the Sanctuary spell. A creature that attacks you and successfully passes the uh, saving throw against Sanctuary is immune for 24 hours. However, for the next minute, you have advantage on attack rolls against the creature, and you may attack twice instead of once when using the attack action on your turn, as long as both attacks target that creature. If you attack or affect a creature with a spell before the creature has successfully attacked you and succeeded on the saving throw against Sanctuary, the creature becomes immune to this effect for 24 hours, and you gain no additional benefits. So that is a very wordy section, but basically it's giving you kind of what the, I think it's the open hand monk, maybe? Or maybe it was, uh, I don't know. I think there's there's either a monk or a fighter out there that basically gets permanent sanctuary on them, which you would have. Uh, so uh, people have to make a wisdom saving throw to be able to successfully attack you. So that's how this would work, right? A creature that attacks you and successfully passes. So normally it's a wisdom saving throw or they waste their attack and they have to attack somebody else. But if they manage to beat your sanctuary save DC and actually hit you, for the next minute, you have advantage on all attack rolls against that creature, and you can attack twice instead of once when you use the attack action, as long as you attack only them. But if you attack or affect somebody else with the spell, um, then the the creature becomes immune and you gain no other benefits. But this could continue to happen, in theory, multiple times. Um, oh, sorry, if you attack or affect another creature with a spell. So... I don't know, it's pretty good. It's Sanctuary Plus, right? It's Sanctuary, but if they manage to hit you, you get benefits. And again, it's a little funky and it kind of breaks the Sanctuary type mechanic, but I don't think it's bad and it seems more like a 17th level ability, something that you have constantly on, right? Permanent flight, permanent resistance, something like that. And this is permanent Sanctuary and then other benefits if they manage to hit you. Again, definitely in my mind outshines the Hoplite's 18th level ability. So let's jump down to, I think it is an election in question. This is the Hecate adventure. Um, so as I said before, you know, you could use, uh, I just wanted to talk real quick before I, I should have talked before I left the page, but I like the Athena subclasses. I would have liked to seen, you know, more, I'm a, again, a big Greek mythology fan. I appreciate that this covered a big spectrum of different gods and goddesses from a bunch of different cultures. Um, Athena probably wouldn't have been my go-to. I probably would have gone with like Poseidon or Zeus or maybe Hades, but you know, Athena is a good one as well. So let's, Regardless, let's jump on Hecate Adventure, right? This is a level eight to 10 adventure, so a little bit later on. And uh, here we go. City of Libris, an endless cloud cover has appeared. At the same time, an election for a new governing body has begun. I should also say these are in like a, it's, it's seemingly a Jetpack 7 setting, but it doesn't have, like I don't have a map or like a true Jetpack setting book that, a Jetpack 7 rather setting book I could show you. So feel free to not use Libris or just supplant Libris into your own homebrew world if you wish. Um, okay, so uh, whatever the general populace doesn't know is that a vampire by the name of Countess Vilrana is secretly swaying the opinions of the nobles with her beguiling charm. It's up to the party to investigate and uncover her meddlings and stop her influence. So we have several adventure hooks to kind of get you involved. They enter the city with a public election drawing near. However, they soon to begin here whispers of confusion and rigged elections. Uh, a dark cloud is hanging over the city. Maybe they are like, that's clearly magical. Let's figure out what's going on there. Uh, or three, the party hears tell of a strange hooded figure who's silently becoming the primary opposition to a political figure despite having very little public interaction. 
All right, then the names are probably one of the best part of this, right? So let's see, we've got a game of names. There are eight nobles responsible for the outcome of the upcoming election. Five of these nobles, unbeknownst to the party and the city's populace, are, I guess I spoilers too, I should have said that at the start, are under the influence of her vampiric charm. The names of the eight nobles are publicly known. Uh, read them following to your players. Some of these you're just going to get a giggle out of your players because of the names, right? So we have Jeremiah Corgrave, a human male known for having great influence over the fur trade. Uh, Tylees uh, Aridosa, half elven female responsible for dealing with arcane items and magical tasks. Graylin Lockhammer, a dwarven male. These are also really good names for the specific races. Uh, dwarven male who owns 90% of the smiths, uh, is responsible for the armor and weapons. Hewer Dragskit, uh, gold dragonborn, who's an expert in negotiation with neighboring cities. Uh, she, she, hi, oh boy, yikes. Uh, we're gonna just call her Shay Merrimond, the half-orc female um, who maintains uh, the militia. Here it is, Killy Tong Ringle Tingle. That's the one. That's gonna get the chuckle out of your players if you don't change it. Rock Gnome female responsible for keeping the treasury in order. Uh, Tad Gunderson, a human male who owns a uh, vineyard. And Mariah Gunderson, uh, his wife, and responsible for the inner workings. She's leading a charitable, uh, leading charitable figure in the city due to her and Tad's massive fortune and generous nature. So you see that five of these have a little asterisk next to them. Those are the ones that are being influenced by the vampire. So it's interesting that Tad is, but his wife is not. All right. So confronting the nobles. Each noble can be confronted individually by the party in specific locations around the city. Each one reacts differently with different forms of questioning. If the party fails two or more charisma checks with an individual to learn a noble's opinions of the candidates, the noble uh, they are speaking to closes off and doesn't reveal any more info. Refer to the descriptions below to uh, on where each noble, where to find them and how they react to the party's interrogation and questioning. All right, so let's zoom in a little bit here. Jeremiah Corgrave near the eastern entrance to the city. He's a proud man, successful intimidation or persuasion check, TC15. Um, required to speak to him to get uh, about who he'll be voting for. Due to his nature, all intimidation checks against him are made with disadvantage. Um, he does reveal he's voting for, he speaks with an uh, almost odd zeal in regards to a new woman vampire, right? Tylese, uh, let's see, you're in her store. She identifies magic items and sells uncommon potions. That's a nice little, give us that little tidbit there. Uh, she speaks freely about her decision to vote uh, for the current mayor. When questioned about the candidate, uh, she lacks any formal opinion as she has never seen this woman, but believes she's meant to be the mayor. Uh, if she's meant to be the mayor, then she will be. All right, so very pragmatic. Graylin Lockhammer, uh, DC 15 intimidation or persuasion check. Uh, if the party buys him a drink, all checks are made with advantage. If they buy him three drinks, he only speaks his mind about the candidates with, oh, he does it with no check needed. If the party buys him five drinks, he passes out and won't be waking up by any non-magical means. Uh, he does, does reveal his opinions. He speaks for his love of the current mayor, uh, but how he just can't help voting for this new woman whose name he doesn't reveal. All right, so our Dragonborn, uh, again, DC 15 Charisma, uh, Intimidation or Persuasion check. He's a shrewd man who sees himself as a cut above the rest. Uh, persuasion checks are at disadvantage. If he reveals his thoughts to the party, um, they learn that he's actually met with this unnamed woman. He reveals that she invited him to her home, a tumble two-story house. He also reveals his favor towards her and intends to cast his vote that way. All right, then we're gonna have Shay here, the half-orc. Uh, she's at the barracks. If approached, she quickly waves off anything the party asks about uh, while simply stating she's voting for the current mayor and doesn't trust this new candidate. Uh, she says that one time she met with this woman, her obvious disinterest left the woman visibly annoyed. Okay. And then we have, oops. Yeah, good old Killy Tong, Ringle Tingle. Uh, uh, also requires a check. She loves the current mayor and, and thinks he listens to her counsel about money very intently. In addition, she has nothing negative to say about the current mayor. While nothing positive to say about this new woman, when pressed, she uh, she realizes she's known nothing about her or her political ideas, despite this, she claims to be voting for her. Okay, that I mean, kind of makes sense. Tad Gunderson also needs the checks. Uh, due to his trusting nature, persuasion checks are made with advantage. If he, he reveals what he knows to the party, relays to them that he's been visiting the woman in the evenings at her house. However, if asked where the house is, he becomes confused and admits he remembers nothing. 
The one piece of information uh, Ted has to offer is the woman's name is Countess Velrana. Well, if your party didn't believe she was a vampire already, she's a countess, immediate vampire, right? That's just how that works. Uh, Mariah Gunderson. Uh, all right, so Mariah's no fool. She's discovered her husband sneaking out. She keeps her information to herself unless she believes the party distrusts the new woman. If she realizes this, she takes the party into private room inside her house, reveals she thinks her husband is having an affair with the new candidate. She tells the party the locations of the woman's house and that Ted regularly goes there in the evenings and doesn't return for several hours. She knows nothing else but implores the party to investigate so she can learn the full story of her husband's late night escapades. All right. So completing the puzzle, once the party learns enough information about her, uh, they can approach her house. Oddly enough, the house seems abandoned when they reach it, though it hasn't fallen into disrepair. It's apparently well kept but empty. The door is locked with a DC 14 check can be opened. Breaking in or entering the house in such a way that generates loud noises alerts anyone inside. Upon entering, the party wishes to remain hidden. DC 18 stealth checks. Oof, okay. If the majority of the house passes, a majority of the party passes the check, they are considered successful. Okay. The interior of the house is well maintained and richly furnished. Uh, successful wisdom uh, DC 13 medicine check reveals wine bottles will be filled with blood instead of wine. I feel like you don't necessarily need a medicine check. If you sniff them, you'll know, or taste them, you'll know. If the party continues to search your house, have one of them make a DC 16 investigation check at an advantage if others are searching with them. On a success, they find that one of the bottles cannot be lifted from where it is left in the cabinet. If they try to move it again, it tilts to one side as if it's been pulled like a lever, typical secret door. Um, the cabinet slides and shifts to the side, revealing a hidden stairway. Depending on whether the party has been noticed, one of the following will happen. If the party has been stealthy uh, and succeeded, they descend the staircase into a large room with a coffin in the center and a shrine of Hecate set up against the far side of the room. Countess Velrana and 1d4 plus 2 vampire spawns sit there speaking softly in prayer. Read the following to your groups as they enter, uh, oh, as they hear her prayer. Great Hecate, we give our thanks and praise to you for the clouds that allow us to walk in the light. We will continue to serve you and make sacrifices to your glory until this entire city bows to you, or be it, uh, be it by their wills or ours. Okay. If the party immediately attacks, uh, the Countess and her vampire spawn are considered surprised for the first round of combat. Otherwise, her and her minions attack the party once they realize they're in the room. If they fail the stealth check, they descend the staircase in a large square room. Sorry if you hear my kids running around upstairs. Uh, is sitting lazily on her coffin. She greets them casually while the vampire spawn hide on the ceiling above the entrance to the basement. The moment the party enters the basement, the vampire spawn attack. Any character with a passive perception 16 or higher uh, notices the vampires and rolls initiative normally. With passive perception of 15 or lower, they are considered surprised. And then the conclusion, if the party uncovers her scheme and destroys her in her home, the five nobles that were beguiled by her regain their senses and remember her forcing them into her favor. Their testimony, along with the coffin and shrine to Hecate in her basement, is evident enough to reveal sabotage in the upcoming election. While the nobles back to their senses, the election continues as normal and the current mayor is re-elected. In addition, the constant cloud over Lyris uh, begins to eventually fade. For their deeds and aids to the city, the party is rewarded 600 gold pieces each, uh, as well as the trust of the city and access to their resources at a discounted price. If the party fails to discover Velrana's location and her true nature, or if the party is defeated by her, she wins the upcoming election and slowly begins turning the citizens uh, into her cattle for her vampire spawn. Shrines to Hecate begin adorning the city as the vampires give praise to the goddess for giving them this opportunity and how fruitful it has become for them. Man, oh man, they are really just, I think they're just hitting the floor with a hammer up there, honestly. So anyway, that is my little bit more of a deeper dive into Gods and Goddesses Redux by Jetpack7. Again, I gave you a little bit. That was kind of one of the, the adventures are about that long. Some of them are slightly longer. I think the Thor-based adventure is a little bit longer and actually has some magic items in it. The Ishtar one actually has a map as well. So anyway, that was that. Thank you once again to the folks at Jetpack7 for sponsoring this video. Hopefully you'll go and check it out and maybe take a look and see what you think. Uh, thank you all so much for watching. Thanks to my patrons on Patreon for continuing to support the channel. And I will see you all next time. <laughs>